What are we doing? What have we done? Ladies and gentlemen, the kids that we lock up, lock out, dismiss, deny, demean, they did not create the communities in which they were born. It's not their fault that the poverty rate has not changed in some of these areas since 1968. It's not their fault that we have a broken educational system, a broken economic system, a broken criminal justice juvenile detention center system. We can't blame them for a society that somehow thinks it's okay that the majority of kids who look like me, who share my hue, will live lives in prison, lives in poverty, Lives addicted to drugs are involved with illegal drug behavior. It's not their fault that society thinks it's okay that they will die at an early age. As mentioned, my name is Sylvester Brown, Jr. I am the director of the Sweet Potato Project. It is a powerful yet very basic program. We secure vacant lots in the city. We recruit young, inner-city, at-risk youth we have them plant sweet potatoes on these vacant lots. For nine, 10 weeks, we teach them marketing, branding, product development, social media skills, how to design a website. We teach them how to stand tall and tell their stories. We teach them, we try to teach them that they have value, that their opinions count, that their community also has value. I've been very blessed to build this program with the North Area Community Development Corporation. Herman Noah is in the audience somewhere. They have allowed me, I mean, together we have created a program that's specifically designed to address young people who are born and raised in poverty. It's a program that, that should appeal to anybody who was born in poverty or anybody who still lives in poverty. In a way, you could say that the Sweet Potato Project represents my life. It is my story. And if you allow me a few minutes, I'd like to tell you a little bit about that story, because if you know my story, then my theme, bringing community back to community, will make a little bit more sense. I was born in 1957. I was born in a time when civil rights legislation, the battle for civil rights was coming to a peak. I am the third oldest of 11 children. My father's name is Sylvester Brown Sr. My mother's name is Evelina. I'll tell you a little bit about my father first. Everybody called my father, for some strange reason, Sonny. His wife, his siblings, his friends, even his children. I called my dad Sonny. Sonny was an amazingly creative guy. He could take a cardboard box, some string, some paint, um, scissors. He could make a movable car, a car that would roll. Doors would open, hood would open, trunk would open. Sonny never lacked for a job. Sonny was a construction worker, a demolition man. He was a over-the-road truck driver. He was a salvage yard worker. He was a back alley mechanic. Unfortunately, Sonny was a chronic alcoholic. Sonny lost just as many jobs as he found. Sonny brought a whole lot of unnecessary trauma and drama into the lives of his wife and children. I remember at the age of six, we moved into the Pruitt Igo housing complex. And a lot of you are familiar with Pruitt Igo. It's taught in universities across, uh, around the country and even overseas as a public housing failure. What's not taught is that there was a strong sense of community in Pruitt Igo. It was caught in the, it was captured in the film The Pruitt Igo Myth. Strong sense of community. There's nothing like a group of poor people, a group of desperate people who have nothing, when they pool their resources, they pool their energies, and they, and they work together against the odds and obstacles. I remember in Pruitt I go, there was always people hustling, and I don't mean in a negative way. 
In every, there was, a, there was 33 11-story buildings on 52 acres of property. In every building, there was a Miss Jenkins selling candy. <laughs> In every building, there was a Mr. Smith with some, with some barbecue. We moved into Prodigo at the same time that President Lyndon Baines Johnson kicked off the war on poverty. I don't know how many of you know this or not, but there was a stipulation. The war on poverty meant that poor people could get money every month, a, a small entitlement. They could get welfare checks. But there was a stipulation. In order to get these welfare checks, to get this money, no man could be in the house. So that, mean that, that meant that fathers, boyfriends, older brothers at a certain age had to leave the home. And what did that mean? You had this great big area of poor people where no men were a stable force. That meant that men who didn't live there, anybody who wanted to commit nefarious acts had this ripe area with vulnerable people to take advantage of. But the positive part of Pruitt Igo, remember my favorite time was the first of the month. It was when we knew for a fact that we were gonna have some food for at least two weeks. We knew for a fact that the tension was gonna be released a little bit. And I remember these women on check day, they'd get together, battalions of women would take turns standing by the mailbox to make sure that everybody got their check. But my favorite time was Sunday, the first Sunday of the month. I remember how everybody would come out of those buildings, they'd walk, they'd take the bus, they'd take a cab to their different religious organizations. But the magic happened when they came back. That's when the women went into the kitchen, took off them fancy hats, <laughs> took off them church clothes. When the kids was told to get out of them good clothes, <laughs> we were sent outside, we played in the hallway, we played from building to building. There was one constant in every building, this warm, beautiful aroma of fried chicken, mashed potatoes, meatloaf, roast beef, chitlins, <laughs> collard greens, sweet potato pie. All that was in the hallway. And on top of that, there was music. This was the Motown time, the late 60s, early 70s. Marvin Gaye, Tammy Terrell, the OJs. Mother, mother. <laughs> I digress. Uh, <laughs> But that, there was a sense of community in Pruitt Igo that's not talked about. We moved out of Pruitt Igo in 1968, and we went down by Produce Row, uh, down by North and Market. It was an area of poor whites and poor blacks. And it was one evening, snowy evening, in the winter of 1968 that I will never, ever forget. Sonny thundered through the door. Evelina, Evelina. Sonny sounded like Fred Sanford. <laughs> <laughs> He said, I hit somebody. And Mama grabbed her two oldest boys, me and my brother Daniel. She grabbed some blankets. We ran down the street. And I remember these big fat snowflakes falling out of the sky. I remember my father's 1950-ish big old ton car turned sideways in the street. And there was a body laying in front of the car. My mother went to the man. She turned him over. She put a blanket over him, looked up at my father with tears in her eyes and said, oh, Sylvester, he's a white man. Now, what did that mean? Think about it. 1968, black man driving inebriated. Black man runs over a white man. My father went to jail for a long, long time. And that's where my mother kicked in, this amazing woman who worked two, three jobs. She worked doing domestic work in the county. She came home. She did uh, seamstress work downtown. She um, worked at a diner late at night, but in between times, she checked in with her 11 kids and she asked us, what did you do today? Did you do your homework? How'd you do in your track meet? She always found time to check in with us. But my mother also knew that she had back in the community. I came up in a community where the schools I attended, the teacher lived in the neighborhood. Had a teacher one time tell me, I'm gonna talk to your mom, and it scared me to death. Because <laughs> I knew she lived right down the street. I had janitors in the neighborhood, police officers who walked the beat, who stopped us and said, what are you doing out here? There was these men, these 
groomed black men with bow ties, bean pies, and newspapers. They'd stop you on the street and say, brother, what you doing out here? Brother, how those grades doing? They had that kind of liberty in the community. That's the kind of community I lived in. And was, I was a really weird kid. I was disconnected from a lot of stuff, and I dreamed a lot. But being one of the oldest kids, one of the kids who um, I had liberties. I could leave the house at 12 in the afternoon and come back at 12 at night if I wanted to. And I spent most of that time walking, walking the street and dreaming. I walk the street and I look at the billboards. I look at the buildings. I look at the cars driving by and dream that I was, that I was visiting those exotic places I saw on the billboards, that I was uh, buying all those wonderful products I saw being advertised, that I was running those businesses, that I was driving those fancy cars. And I remember, as a dreamer, my dreams were validated. I'll give you a couple examples. When I was 15 years old, I worked at Angelo's on the Hill, Italian restaurant. And there was a lawyer who worked for the restaurant. His name was Saul. Saul came back in the kitchen one time and said, kid, I heard you wrote a book. And I did. At the age of 14, I wrote a book. It wasn't a very good book. It was a cross between good times and the fugitive. <laughs> but it had a beginning, middle, and end. Saul said he's going to publish my book, took my book. At that same restaurant was a young lady by the name of Susie. Susie was a waitress, but she's also a Washington University student. Susie took me to Washington University, one of her deans. Mr. Dean, this kid has something special. Can we get him in the university? The dean said, why, sure, yes, we can. Here's some paperwork. You'll hear from me. The moral of the story is that I never heard from the dean, never got into Washington University, never heard from Saul again. But for a moment, I dreamed. I dreamed that I was this young, polished, scholarly student walking on the green campus of Washington University. I dreamed that I was a young, published author. Dreaming. I came from a community where people would stop you and say, kid, you have something special. Let me take you to this place where it can be used. Keep that in mind. I submit to you that our young people today, they don't have the same luxury, the same privilege to dream like we did. Our young people live in a, re, in a world of harsh reality, shoved in their face every minute. In this Facebooking, Twittering, LinkedIn, kicked-in world of ours, reality is always shoved in their face. They see horror all over the world, and what they really see is how the world sees them and how the world reacts to them. Our children cannot go to bed at night without watching a news story that's gonna show somebody with handcuffs on who looks like them being led to jail. Our kids cannot wake up in the morning without hearing a negative story about North St. Louis. Our kids have well-meaning teachers who tell them, you've got to get out, get a good education, escape. Here's Denzel Washington, he got out. There's Carrie Washington, she got out. I don't know any more Washingtons, but <laughs> they got out. We've been getting out for 50 years. It's time for us to get in. It's time for us to stay in. I'm not asking all you guys to move into North St. Louis. <laughs> Be nice, but bring your heart, bring your passion, bring your resources, bring your energy. Ladies and gentlemen, I, walk, I work with young people who simply amaze me. You'll be surprised what these kids know, what these kids can do. Just think about it. Just like their ancestors, their parents, and their grandparents, they are born in survival mode. They got to figure out a way to get, to get around the neighborhood. They got to look at what somebody's wearing to see if that's a dangerous color. They have to they have to take a little bit and make a lot. They have to stay fashionable, and they find ways to do it. What happens when we look at these kids and say, you're going to change the future. You're going to show North St. Louis that we can grow some, product, grow some produce, make some products, create some jobs. You empower them, because no one ever talks to them like that. 
give you an example of what happened in class a couple of times. I, had, I gave the kids a one-hour assignment. Your job is to create a marketing campaign based, uh, that would, that would uh, sell a product or a service. Five, uh, the kids got together, five of them came up with five different campaigns. Two of them I'm gonna tell you about quickly. One was called the Swag Kit. It's kind of self-explanatory. <laughs> Buy a kit, have all the right hat, the clothes, the shoes, the swag. You swag for like $200 to $2,000. Not a very unique idea, but I guarantee you if Jay-Z or Russell Simmons put their name on it, it'd be a multi-million dollar idea. Now, the second idea. These kids came up with a candy. Candy, you eat the candy, and it would change your eye color, change your hair color. You'd laugh. I, I don't blame you. I thought, silly kids. But, <laughs> but there was a chemist in the audience, in, in the classroom that day, and the chemist sat there like this. And I said, what's the matter? The chemist said, you're not gonna believe this. I've got a colleague right now who's trying to get a patent on an eye color pill. Our kids in one hour came up with that idea. What would happen if we gave them 12 hours, 20 hours, 10 weeks, and told them your idea is valuable? How do we bring community back to community? The answer is embedded in the story I told you about my life. Many kind-hearted, benevolent people took me by the hand and walked me to opportunity. They stopped me and said, kid, what are you doing? You've got something special. We need to walk these kids to something special. We need to let these kids know that they have inherent abilities, unique skills that we can turn around, that they can turn around in their own communities. We need to build an environment where we can grow opportunity, where we can grow community, we can grow futures. How do we build communities? Let's take another walk, the kind of walk I took when I was young. Walk with me, dream with me. Let's walk into North St. Louis. Right now we have two vacant lots. We're making one product, sweet potato cookies. We have a wonderful relationship with St. Louis University. They're turning our produce into products. Imagine 10 lots, 12 lots, two whole city blocks of massive farming. Imagine a factory connected to the farm where we turn the produce into products. Imagine the factory where we package the produce that we make and we sell it to restaurants, to local schools. We sell it in our community, we create jobs around the food that we're growing. Imagine a school connected where the kids can be inspired 24 seven. Imagine the spinoff businesses, the bakeries, the grocery stores. Imagine the distribution company, the trucking company. We're talking about businesses and jobs within the community where people know each other, where people know the history and know the family. This is how you build communities. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for listening to my TED Talk. Thank you for walking with me and dreaming with me. You've heard, about, you've heard my story. You've heard about my project. Heard about my kids. I need all kinds of people. This is a big vision. We need folks in packaging, folks in, in uh, food production, folks who know about massive growing. We need a lot of people. We need people who can simply sit with these kids and say, I hear you. So thank you. But I invite you to turn my story, my project, my kids, our project, our kids, our story. Thank you. <laughs>